Hi. That's loud. Um, uh, we're going to pour you some stuff from uh, northern Arizona uh, on the slopes of Jerome, Mingus Mountain area. Uh, it's a Cabernet. Uh, it's gone now. We had Pierce's disease. I had to pull it all out, so we replanted. So. Yeah, we have things growing now, it's fine. We're going to back it up with some Nebbiolo and some Aliandico. Uh But to echo what uh, Anne had mentioned earlier about the Italian varietal, same thing. I planted what I like. Uh, and uh, what Ken had said, where there's a lot of experimentation going on in the state. We have uh, Sangrentino planted, Barbera, Merlot, um, Aliandico, uh, Montepulciano, Sangiovese, several different clones of Sangiovese, Tempranillos, of course. Uh, obviously, Bianca, Alvarino. So we're just trying to figure out, you know, in northern Arizona, what's going to be the grape. So far, the shiners have been, of course, uh, Tempranillo, as you've seen across the state. Uh, Syrahs in some spots work really well. And obviously, a Bianca, of course, just it's killing it all over the state. Uh, we have some of that planted as well. Um, what you're drinking here is a Cabernet, uh, 2008 uh, Judas Cab. Um, it's a uh, very small site. Uh, about a half an acre, maybe three quarters of an acre of vines uh, that uh, we harvested. Roughly cropping at about two tons an acre, if I get the math right. Um, with uh, Chris at the helm. My vineyard manager over here is Chris Turner, so uh, I'm definitely going to stick the mic in his face in a second to let you kind of uh, work him over on uh, the site characteristics. But uh, this site is a very unique site. Uh, uh, as Cynthia also said, is like just uh, there's boulders, there's decomposed granite, there's caliche, there's some kind of weird black layer or something. I don't know what it is. Um, it's it's a great, it's a wonderful, uh, diverse site. You know, lots of complexities. There's mesquite growing all over it. We have a lot of aromatic herbs growing around the area, and a lot of, of course wildflowers. So there's all kinds of interesting things happening around the site, just that make this site unique. I have a tempranillo block planted right next to it. And uh, a couple days ago, a couple, like a month ago, uh, I had uh, a bunch of friends over, Tim White, Joe Bichard, and we, we tasted through the 07, 08, uh, 2010, 2011, and from barrel sample, uh, 2012, uh, this wine. And it's interesting how, as we get into the uh, 12 and 13, of course, we have more Tempranillo involved because all the cab is gone. The Tempranillo screams varietal characteristic, the Cabernet screams varietal characteristic, but the site actually speaks louder than those varietals, because all those wines were pretty consistent. All five years uh, spoke the same, uh, you know, they had the same bouquet, they had the same body, uh, so it's very, it's a, it's a testament to uh, site characteristic and site specificity, so um, hope you're enjoying this. Uh, Chris, you want to come up and talk about soils? Anybody have any questions about this site? No. Uh, psych! <laughs> uh, it's in Jerome on the side of the hill, southeast facing slope, about uh, almost at the top of the uh, three quarter, above the three quarter mark, just below the, the, uh, the top. Uh, it's overlooking, kind of, yeah, southeast facing slope, and it looks kind of toward Camp Verde, kind of what area. Um, The site. the site is a, a mixed alluvium. Um, it's uh, calcareous for sure. Uh, and we do have some hard pans. Uh, the way that this vineyard was installed was uh, basically there were three foot, four foot holes dug into the side of the mountain, jackhammered out. There's a lot of cobblestone, a lot of gravel. And then what we did is um, we went ahead and backfilled these pots, these custom pots, which each vine is situated in, and uh, filled them with a lot of the soil that comes from one of the sites in Cornville, close to uh, Cynthia's site, and so we have a mix. We have a sandy loam with uh, tuff in it, so you have uh, the volcanic ash in there as well, mixed in with um, the limestone, and, uh, and then went ahead and, and Planted the vines, and this is kind of what we got. One of the characteristics of uh, grapes that are grown on uh, limestone soils is that they may lack color. Uh, a lot of the wines that come from Burgundy and Bordeaux, 
um, seem to lack color, but they don't lack body. I mean, an interesting wine, maybe a Grand Cru wine, is something that has uh, something that stands out, personality, character. So it's something that catches your attention and brings you right back. The earthiness in the wine, when you taste it, you're all of a sudden you're like, what is this? I need to taste more. You want to taste the different layers in that wine. The, another important thing about a wine that is grown to those specifications is basically you have to, it's a mix, it's the soil, it's the winemaker, it's how you grow the grapes, location, in this vineyard it's at 5,000 feet. And then it's microclimate. So if we have a temperature that's 100 degrees, you know, you have to try to do things to adjust the canopy to make the microclimate for the fruit, mm, you know, better. So you can achieve the wine that you want to achieve. One of the characteristics of a wine that's a great wine is a wine has to have a finish. So when you taste a wine and you swallow it, you breathe out of your nose, you have it. It's like, wow, it just stays and lasts forever and ever. I feel that this wine definitely has it. Do you feel it? It does. So that's a key sign, a most integral component to world-class wines. And they don't, I mean, I mean, there's some houses in Burgundy, like the Romani Conti, and you can drink these wines, and, and most years they're fantastic, but not always. So it kind of gives you that question of terroir, where it's like it's the same site, it's grown the same way, everything's done, it's made the same way, but this year it didn't quite have that excitement, that personality that it had last year. And, you know, so you have to take the other components. Climate, weather, I think it's all the variables that come together to make the, the great wine. And I feel that this site is definitely one of those sites that, you know, and someday could be considered a Grand Cru site. Um, a couple other notes on the area. Uh, we have other sites down in, in more the, in the Cornville area. We have one site that we actually dry farm, which is not necessarily a good thing. Um, it's hard to control the water you know, when you're trying to, like, get to get closer to harvest and concentrate the fruit. When you have such I mean, an easy access to the water table, you can't really uh, keep keep that in check. But uh, the, I think the site, this, this site that, that Chris is describing is such a unique site uh, in that it's on the side of the hill. It's all also very expensive to farm because it's all, can't get any equipment in. It's all hand farmed. Uh, when we get the late spring frost or the May snow that we get every three years, uh, you can't turn on fans, you can't do smudge pots because it's on the side of a hill. There's no way to protect it. So it really is a crapshoot on a site like this. And, you know, as, as I said, labor intensive to hand farm it all. But I think, you know, if we get the same, if we get this kind of result, you know, two out of three years, I think it's totally worth it, the effort. So thank you for coming.